On a Beam of Light, a story of Albert Einstein. Over a hundred years ago, as the stars swirled in the sky, as the earth circled the sun, as the March winds blew through a little town by a river, a baby boy was born. His parents named him Albert. Albert turned one year old and didn't say a word. Albert turned two and didn't say a word. Albert turned three and hardly said a word at all. He just looked around with his big, curious eyes, looked and wondered, looked and wondered. His parents worried. Little Albert was so different. Was there something wrong? But he was their baby, so they loved him, no matter what. One day, when Albert was sick in bed, his father brought him a compass, a small round case with a magnetic needle inside. No matter which way Albert turned his compass, the needle always pointed north, as if held by an invisible hand. Albert was so amazed, his body trembled. Suddenly, he knew there were mysteries in the world, hidden and silent, unknown and unseen. He wanted, more than anything, to understand those mysteries. Albert started asking questions, questions at home, questions at school, so many questions that some of his teachers told him he was a disruption to his class. They said he would never amount to anything unless he learned to behave like all the other students. But Albert didn't want to be like the other students. He wanted to discover the hidden mysteries in the world. One day, as Albert was zipping through the countryside on his bicycle, he looked up at the beams of sunlight speeding from the sun to the earth. He wondered, what would it be like to ride one of those beams? And in his mind, right then and there, Albert was no longer on his bicycle, no longer on the country road. He was racing through space on a beam of light. It was the biggest, most exciting thought Albert had ever had, and it filled his mind with questions. Albert began to read and study. He read about light and sound, about heat and magnetism, and about gravity, the invisible force that pulls us down toward our planet and keeps the moon from floating away into outer space. Albert read about numbers. He loved numbers. They were like a secret language for figuring things out. But all that reading still didn't answer all of Albert's questions. So he kept on reading, wondering, and learning. When Albert graduated from college, he wanted to teach the subjects he loved, all the things he had read about all those years. But Albert couldn't find a job as a teacher, so he got another job. A simple, quiet job in a government office, an office where he worked with other people's ideas and inventions. He did his work very well and very quickly, so quickly that he had lots of extra time to think and wonder. Albert watched a lump of sugar dissolve and disappear into his hot tea. How could this happen, he wondered. He watched the smoke from his pipe and swirl and disappear into the air. How could one thing disappear into another, he thought. Then he began to figure it out. He thought about the idea that everything is made out of teeny tiny moving bits of stuff, far too tiny to see, little things called atoms. Some people didn't believe that atoms existed, but Albert's figuring helped prove that everything in the world is made of atoms. Everything, even sugar and tea, even smoke and air, even Albert and you, even this book, is made of atoms.
Then Albert thought about motion. He realized that everything is always moving, moving through space, through time, even sound asleep we're moving as our planet circles the sun and our lives travel into the future. Albert saw time and space as no one had before. Albert wrote down his new ideas and put them into envelopes and sent them to science magazines. The magazines printed everything Albert sent. He hoped that scientists and professors would be interested, and they were, very interested indeed. They asked Albert to come work with them and teach with them. For the first time in his life, people started to say, Albert is a genius. Now Albert could spend all his days doing what he loved, imagining, wondering, figuring, and thinking. Albert thought about very, very big things, like the size and shape of the entire universe. He thought about very, very small things, like what goes on inside the atoms that everything is made of. He thought about mysterious forces like magnetism and gravity. He discovered whole new ways to understand how all these things work. Everywhere Albert went, he would think and think. One of Albert's favorite thinking places was his little sailboat. He loved to let his mind wander as the wind blew him across the water. Sometimes when Albert was having a tough time with a tricky problem, he would put it aside and play his violin. Music made Albert happy. He said it helped him think better. Albert even chose his clothes for thinking. His favorite were his coffee old, comfy old soggy baggy sweaters and pants and shoes without socks. He said now that he was grown up, no one could tell him to put on his socks. In town where he lived, he became known for wandering around deep in thought, sometimes eating an ice cream cone always recognizable with his long, wild hair, which by then had become quite white. Everywhere Albert went, he tried to figure out the secrets of the universe, and he never forgot about that beam of light that he rode so long ago in his imagination. Albert figured out that no person, no thing, could ever zoom through space as fast as a beam of light. He figured that if he could travel near the speed of light, crazy things would happen. Only minutes would pass for Albert, while years and years went by for the rest of us. This idea was so amazing, people didn't believe it at first. But scientists today have proven it's true. Albert thought and figured until the very last minute of the very last day of his life. He asked questions never asked before, found answers never found before, and dreamed up ideas never dreamt before. Albert's ideas helped build spaceships and satellites that travel to the moon and beyond. His thinking helped us understand our universe as no one had ever before. But still, Albert left us many big questions. Questions that scientists are working on today. Questions that someday you may answer by wondering, thinking, and imagining.